Hey, how's it going, everyone? Back for another episode of Off the Pitch with myself, Lane Dayton, and my co-host, Daniel Rowley, coming from Leeds United Kingdom. We're going to be talking about everything from the Dirk Klasker rivalry between Dortmund and Bayern Munich in Germany, all the way to the Premier League to Liverpool's big loss to Fulham and the Manchester Derby, and all the way to CONCACAF football to talk about the Jamaican takeover and what they might do in the next World Cup. Right after this, and even more. Well, we saw Liverpool suffer their sixth home defeat in a row. First time ever in the club's history. It's an unbelievable loss. Like, no one ever saw it coming. Mario Lamina finished it off with a beautiful goal for Fulham. They were resolute defensively. Fulham were looked like a different side once again. They have been on great form. What do you think of their performance in the goal for Mario Lamina? Yeah, very good goal. Uh, very well taken goal. Uh, credit to Fulham for that. Um, but I don't think the performance itself was anything special, but I don't think Liverpool was special either. Um, Fulham, just they got the goal and sat, sat 11 men behind the ball, made it difficult for Liverpool to get anywhere. Don't get me wrong, they still pressed up a few times when they were in possession. Um, but this is all they're looking for now. More than anything, what's important for Fulham is keeping a clean sheet. Um, doing that is key if they want to even chance survival in the league. They've... The gaining on Newcastle now in points, and it's a big win for them beating Liverpool at Anfield. Um, I do think they're in with a chance at survival. I do personally hope that Newcastle just pulls something out of the bag and manages to stay in and let Fulham go back down. But I, I do think that they're doing well with what they've got. Uh, but yeah, good goal. Um, apart from Liverpool, though, um, I think Liverpool made it way too easy for them. In defence, they didn't look anything special, they couldn't do anything with it in midfield. Um, just, just didn't look like they wanted to be there. Uh, looked like they had no heart in the game. There's not a lot to say without repeating ourselves every week now. Liverpool have been bad champions and we've said it every week so far and we'll keep saying it as long as as long as long they keep losing. They haven't been great and they're not looking great and it's God knows where it's going to take them, but I still don't think they'll make Europa personally. Yeah, Liverpool fans probably hate us for how much we talk about them and how much we're slating them off. But, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I don't think they're going to get any Europa, Europa League or even Champions League. Like, the form they're on is terrible. Six home defeats in a row. Like, this is just awful. Like, to ever see this in the club's history, you got them winning their first Premier League in forever. The year before that, they won the Champions League. And now they're sitting in eighth position. But, I mean, Fulham's been on a great run. I know you slayed them off last week. We were talking about Newcastle going down, but now they're tied on points with Brighton to stay up. I think this Fulham team reminds me of Aston Villa last year. They kind of got a run of form going towards late of the season, and then they kind of slowly picked up, started gaining some clean sheets, and looking like they have a chance. They built some chemistry. I think Fulham could be the Aston Villa of last year. I think they could. I think any team who's going down, I think it might be Brighton. I think uh, Newcastle could find – they got some – better players in Brighton, obviously, to St. Maxim and Joel Linton. They, they could stay up, in my opinion. I think they could win, stay up, win a few games, stick out some draws. Dubravka's good in net. you got some good keepers there. You're fine. I think they can do it. But, but uh, Liverpool, I think it's crisis time for them. This is looking very bad for them. I mean, yes, Klopp is desperate, but you saw him play Salah down the middle at number nine position. He sat Bobby Firmino and he sat Sadio Mane. Which I he got a stat saying that they've played in so many games and they're so tired. And why would you rest them in this game? I understand it's Fulham, but they're on an amazing run currently. Yes, it, yes, they're lower down the table, but I wouldn't rest them against them because they Liverpool needs a win and to rest probably your two better players and play Salah out of position to accommodate for Shakiri. And yeah, I don't know why he would bench in this game. Yes, they're tired and they're. They've played a lot of games consecutively. Do you think Klopp is desperate and he's looking for options, or do you think he's just scrambling here to try to find something? I, I, I couldn't even tell you. I wouldn't know where to begin. Like, like you say, from Liverpool to win the Champions League and the Club World Cup, to win the Premier League title, and then to be eighth in the Premier League is is just you wouldn't you couldn't write it. Um, it it's a worry, but. No, I don't think, I've always stood by, as a professional player, you shouldn't need to be rested. Um, your, your fitness should be good enough. It's it's not like you're playing games back to back to back to back, literally one after the other, then fair enough. Then rest each other if you're playing on the day after, you're going to be a bit sore. But yeah, you're playing one game a week two, usually tops. It's, as a professional player, you're getting paid the kind of money, the fitness they should have is, is unreal. They shouldn't need to be rested. 
Um, don't get me wrong, fair enough if you've come back off an injury um, and your, your, your injury's taken a toll on you, as we've seen in players before that have come back too early off injury or they come back and do too much off injury. Um, but I, I don't think any Premier League player, especially Premier League players, should need resting after a game. Um, if you've got the option to change it up and change tactics and confuse and make it, uh, it difficult to play against, hell yeah, go for it. Um, as, as an option as there as a manager, like I know you'll have seen Man City's bench at the weekend. Realistically, that's another six players um, you could have literally put on the pitch and swapped the whole team up. That's the kind of option you want to have. You want to be able to make it hard to plan to play against them because you can put any sort of team out and still be strong. So fair enough if you've got that. But if you haven't got that, like Liverpool haven't at the minute, um, this they shouldn't still need resting. Um, but the players just haven't stepped up. They're, they're not playing with any passion. Um, I think they took the first defeat at home. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was against Southampton this season, wasn't it, the first home defeat? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the first defeat against Southampton, I think they lost their heads. I think they lost their heads, and I think after that, they've just not played with any passion, any pride. There just doesn't seem to be any anything in it for me. I just I, I can't see what's going wrong. Um, yeah, they've taken injuries. Every team takes injuries, though. Um, and this is what we've said on previous weeks: is yeah. you can't go and blame all this on injuries. Man City have had a few injuries. Leicester have had injuries. Leeds have had injuries. Every team takes injuries. Um, and it's you can't you can't blame losses on the backs of injuries. Fair enough, if you're full starting elevens out injured, go for it. Then complain about injuries. But the players they've got, yeah, they've lost Van Dijk and Gomez. But the players they've got are good enough as backup. But it's not the defence that's the issue. All this time, yeah, they're conceding, but they're also not scoring. Um, they've still got most of the key players in midfield and up front. I, I just, I, yeah, like I said, I don't want to repeat myself and repeat myself each week when it comes to Liverpool. But yeah, they're just not looking good still. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure if they've gotten the next run up of games. But to be fair, though, you'd have said Fulham at home should have been an easy game for him. So God knows what Liverpool's going to do now. No run-ups easy for them anymore. You, you, like I said, you'd have looked at Fulham and you'd have been like, ah, oh, Fulham at Anfield, yeah, they should be all right. They should be should be coming out with should be coming out with at least one or three points, and then Liverpool go and don't come out with anything. So no, no game's an easy game now for them. They've, they've just got to take each game as it comes. They've got to get their heads down. And they've got to start playing with some pride again. There's Premier League champions that shouldn't be where they are. And looking at it, they've no chance of winning the Premier League now. No, they're not going to do a back to back, but they should at least be making or pushing for that Champions League spot. And they just don't look eager for it at the minute. Yeah, for sure. I want to finish off your injury topic because I know we've talked about it for a couple of weeks. But Liverpool fans have been saying their best players are out, like Van Dyke, Henderson, Fabinho. Yeah, sure, you got your three best players. And they're saying that's why they can't make a run for the, the title. But then you look at the the blue side of Manchester, and they don't have a number nine all year in Kuniguero, arguably one of the best or the best striker to ever play in the Premier League. And then you don't have Kevin De Bruyne, arguably the best attacking midfielder in the world or in the Premier League. And they're winning the league by 11 points, basically a landslide at this point. I think they're running away with this. But I don't think injuries can be an argument for Liverpool. We'll move away from that talk now. We talked about it for a couple of weeks, but... Like you said about uh, how they lost their first home game, I think the, the Burnley and Brighton loss has really summed it up for me. Because I think uh, Klopp got out. I, yes, there was a low block, but they they just looked like they didn't want to go for it. They were terrible. They had no efforts on target. Target bleeding looks like Sanchez in the Brighton net was really troubled. Same with Pope. I mean, that was a couple of weeks ago, but still. I mean, I wasn't scared for uh, Fulham here. Alphonse Areola, yes, he's from PSG, but he looked comfortable all game to me. Yes, Fulham defended resolutely. They they look good to me. Their side is going to stay up. But, yeah, like Liverpool didn't create much to really scare me, in my opinion. But I think the injuries and in the forward rotation, I think this has to come under management. Yes, Klopp's in a great job. But I think you got to look at his options. Yes, Matt City have a tremendous bench and Fernand Torres, Mares, and all the options they have. But, yes, Liverpool still have Shaqiri. They had Minamino. Klopp bought him. He thought he was a tremendous player, and he gets rid of him. Like, you could have been rotating and subbing those two on all season, giving Salah and Mane rest, Firmino rest, and instead of worrying about injuries and subbing them out when you're in a crisis. Now you got Firmino gone and Shakiri. well, he hasn't played all year. So he's obviously going to be rusty when you throw him in. You can't just be like, go out and win us the game. Yes, he has done that in recent years. I know that as a United fan, he did that to us when Mourinho was here, costing him his job. 
But yeah, I, I hate to say it, but I think this is management fault. Yes, he's he's done well, but th- this season I think uh, injuries coming under his fault. He needs to rotate more, in my opinion. But uh, this Liverpool team to get out of this crisis and this rut in the road for them. Do you think who do you think that has to leave in the summer? They got a front three. There's been a lot of talk of one or two of them leaving. Who do you think out of that front three would probably leave to change this team or to get some money in the door? It's hard to say. Um, personally, I'd say Salah's. Salah's an easy one. Yeah, a lot of teams will take him. And I think, personally, for me, I think Salah's more suited to European football rather than English. Um, I think he'd look good in, in, in the German leagues, or even the Italian leagues. I think he'd tear it up a little bit more. Um, he, he just gets bullied off the ball too easy in English football. And obviously, we all know he wins a lot of fouls because of it. The way the way he looks like he could be on the Egyptian diving team in the Olympics as well as the, as well as the football team. But um, but I do think Salah's he's got to be the big buying point. I think he's been there a couple of years now. Um, Liverpool could still easily sell him, even though he's had. I mean, he's one of the top scorers still in the league. But even though he's had a poorer season, I think he's, he's still. He, he could still get a lot of money for him, um, and I think that could fund quite a few transfers for Liverpool if they spend wisely and don't spend stupid. What they don't want to do is sell Salah for X amount and then go and buy the, a player back for that amount of money. They want to invest the money in younger players like I'm using Lee as an example but Rafinha the bloke's cost is 17 million which a lot of people have cost it said his bargain of the season you don't need but it's proof that you don't need to spend big money to get good players you can if you if you buy right we could, we could buy five of Rafinha if not more for the amount that Liverpool probably will sell Salah for like it's it's easy money really nowadays is football if you just do it right um, and I think that's what they've got to do. Sell a player like Salah, bring someone in good enough to replace him. Um, but you're not looking to fill his boots, you're just looking to fill a position. They're good enough to replace him, fill a few other gaps, and I think they, they, they can still get a... They've still got a title-winning team. Mm-hmm. A, a, a title-winning team. Um, they can easily do it. It's, it's just how much they want it. Um, and I think this season, I think, personally, I think they let it get to their heads too much last season. Um They've come back this season. Uh, Leeds sort of showed them up for the first game. Uh, a couple of other teams sort of put a bit of pressure on them and then Southampton beating them. They just haven't got the one. Um, but if they get that back in them, they're a strong side and they're going to be hard to beat for anyone on their given day. Um, I don't take that away from Liverpool. They are still a good squad. It's just the one they've got to win that game each day they come to it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like... See, you're saying Salah should leave, in your opinion. I think that's a great idea. But I would take the opposite approach. I would... Uh, Build around Mo Salah. I mean, I mean, I think you're right. I think he is suited for better, different leagues. He does get bullied off the ball quite a bit. But if you look at this Liverpool team, they're nothing without Salah. When he doesn't score, they don't win. He's obviously the top goal scorer in the league, which is unbelievable for how bad this Liverpool team has been. And I think that's incredible by his standards. I think I would sell Mane and Firmino, or one of them, and then get yourself a new striker and a new winger, or even bring back Minamino. He's looked good at Southampton. He looked good at Salzburg before he came. He hasn't been bad coming off the bench. You could start Minamino out wide and bring in a star striker, bring in, bring in a big name, try to get Mbappe. I know it's going to be hard because Liverpool don't really spend the big money. But, I mean, if you spend uh, get rid of Mane, I think he'd be great in the Spanish league with his pace, his attacking ability. I think he'd be great in that league. You definitely could get a buyer for Mane. Firmino go back to the German league. I think you could do that. Build around Mo Salah because your midfield is going to be – Henderson, Fabinho, you're still going to have a good midfield with Jones there too. And I mean, I want to talk about Thiago Alcantara for a minute here. Everyone uh, thought this was going to be the bargain of the summer. All of the Liverpool fans were humming and hawing about him. $35 million, what a bargain. But he's really not impressed. He's been quite poor. Uh, he's A lot of counterattacks they've had. He's really just took the ball, took a couple touches, slowed the ball down when he could have one touch knocked the ball wide. Salah gone, but he just slows the game down. I mean, at Bayern Munich, he might have looked better around Goretzka and Kimmich. I mean, I'm guessing you're not the biggest Bundesliga fan in England, but what do you think of uh, Thiago? And did you expect this from him, or did you think it'd be a lot better with what his ability is? He's, he's an older player. The second you sign an older player that's had a couple of good seasons, you never know if they're going to be a hit or if they're going to be a flop. I still think 35 million for what they got for him is a good price for a player for for going off the back of the season that he'd had. Arguably one of the best players in the league. 
um, that season. I, I think 35 million was a fair asking price. Um, a little bit older, so you, you knock a, a bit off there, which I think they will have done. Um, but yeah, I don't think they got a bad price for him. Um, I personally think he's gone to the wrong team. Um, they've gone in, they, they've expected the world of him, and he hasn't been able to deliver that. Um, understandably, you, you, you can't form a one player team where one player comes in and changes the team completely. Um, yeah, I do think that Liverpool had too high expectations for him. Um, maybe he's been played a little bit wrongly. Maybe Klopp hasn't played him how he, how he could have done. Uh, hasn't used him as, to his advantage as much as he could have done. The guy, you see the clips in training of him absolutely doing him. The rest of the Liverpool players, he, the skill he's got is incredible. But it comes to the game and it's like he just like he prefers showing up his mates in training rather than actually embarrassing someone else on the pitch. Um, but I think he, he he hasn't been used right. Like I say, the, the skill the guy's got and the skill you see him have, and you just look at the game and you can't see that skill come out in him. Um, but I, I do think, yeah, another club would have probably used a little bit better. Um, but I think he's past his time now. Uh, he, he's, he's aged on a little bit now. If he doesn't have another couple of good seasons, it doesn't improve at Liverpool and maybe have a good next season. I think he's, he's not looking at much more. Um, it's all downhill from here really for him if he doesn't say, doesn't show his worth but he, the, the guy's got potential still you don't know it, but we've always said it you, you can do it in one league but can you do it in another it's the same the step up from championship to Premier League the step of di difference from the Bundesliga to, 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 to Premier League there's a lot more competition in the Premier League it's not like the not to insult any teams in the Bundesliga, but you, you've got your top few clubs, and that's mostly Bayern and uh, Dortmund. Apart from that, you're not really often seeing anyone even nearly winning that title. Maybe a couple of the other clubs. I'm, like I say, I don't follow much Bundesliga. But apart from them two clubs, you don't really hear about much coming out of it. And, and when you, you've got a player that's doing well over there, it doesn't mean he can do well over here. Um, it, it means he's probably going to, and you, we've seen a lot of players come over from the Bundesliga and absolutely tear it up. Um, but we've also seen a lot of flops before, and it looks like Thiago's been one of them. Yeah, I mean, personally, I think Thiago's been a flop. I mean, yes, everyone was expecting him to keep up this winning culture, and uh, he should be picking up this team and taking them by the scruff of the neck as Champions League winner from last year. I think he should be dragging this team to get a victory or to pick up the pace a bit in this team and build some confidence, but he hasn't really done that. And especially, for, I, think, I mean, $35 million is cheap in today's market for a player coming from a Champions League team and starting 11. But I still do think he's a flop. Like, he was supposed to be this unbelievable signing, and he hasn't really been. But, I mean, we've talked about Liverpool for quite a bit here. We're going to jump on to a Champions League possibility team next year, and we'll talk about them right after the break. Leicester City managed to beat Brighton and Ovalvian 2-1 on this weekend. A couple goals goals from Leicester. Great football they played. They're a good team here, Leicester. They, they're pushing for Champions League. They're right on Manchester United's heels. Only 12 points behind Manchester City, which is unbelievable because everyone talks about City running away with it. But let's talk about um, the game. What did you think about the performance here from Leicester and uh, how Brighton did? Yeah, I, 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 Honestly, I thought both teams looked quite well. I don't think Brighton looked particularly poor at any point. I just think Leicester played them well. Um, but we saw as well, Brighton managed to get a goal. And a hell of a goal it was. Um, absolutely brilliant goal. It's just one of those games for Brighton. and they, they didn't come out on top. I think on another day, they could have won that game with a little bit better defence than that. Um, but yeah, Leicester just looked like they, they, they want that second place spot off Man United. Um, they're, they're basically, to me, the same. we're not backing down off City yet. Um, obviously, 12 points behind at this stage in the game. Something would have to seriously go wrong for Manchester City for them to not win the league at this point. Um, but I do think there's, there's still potential for Leicester to just want to say we're, we're not giving up yet. Um, we're, we're not we're not accepting defeat. We want to challenge that second space spot. We want to take Man United out. Um, and they're looking good. The team they've got, we know they can do it anyway. And um, we've seen them do it before. And 
they're an incredible team when they want to play together. Jamie Vardy looked on his game again yesterday. A couple of the plays Leicester did was just outstanding. And I think the goals were incredible as well to save for it. Um, and as we've already said about injuries, but they're another team. James Madison and Harvey Barnes, I believe, are both out at the moment. They're you two central midfielders. They're coping without them and they're still getting the wins and they're still creating chances and they're still looking the same incredible Leicester. Um, and yeah, I think this Brighton, like you say, they're, they're, they're looking at relegation, um, so they are fighting for it. So it's not an easy game for Leicester, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they, they look good. And second place is definitely still an option for Leicester, and I think they're still going to try and close that points gap off from City as much as they can. Yeah, well, like you said, anytime you go away to a relegation battle side, you know it's going to be a difficult game at this point of the year because they're just fighting for their lives. It was a beautiful goal from Brighton. I mean, what a what a hit! Like Le Leicester really fought for this one. They're, like you said, this I hate talking about injuries, but this team, James Justin's gone with that ACL. You got Madison, Harvey Barnes. Like that's some unbelievable English talent, and their biggest piece is really in their lineup besides Vardy and Fofana. Like this this team is really Champions League caliber. I don't know why some people don't put them up there because I think they should be always a lock for top four. They have some fantastic players. It's like eventually Casper Schmeichel's gonna have to move on. He's getting up there in age and whatnot. But same with Johnny Evans and whatnot. But yeah, they do have a fantastic team. A lot of young youth. James Justin, Fofana, recent pickup. Madison's very young. Harvey Barnes is still young. Like Pereira's not old. Like only two guys you're really gonna have to move on soon from is Vardy and Schmeichel. And goalkeeper you can always fill in eventually for and. Right now, they're looking at Ivan Tony right now from Brentford to fill in for Vardy, signing him this summer for $25 million as a talk, which would be a great signing, I think, ex-Newcastle striker. Um, in your opinion, do you think um, uh, Leicester can hop United at the end of the season and take second pot spot, or do you think they'll drift back and maybe settle for third or fourth? No, I think Leicester are the kind of team that will constantly push for that top spot. I think... As long as injuries don't really take a toll, because I know we've talked about Liverpool and blaming injuries, but Leicester really can. They, they have lost their midfield, and uh, Vardy's been injured prone all season. Um, they're, they're the goal-scoring capabilities. They can do it without them. Um, but I do think if you lose all three of them, you're losing a big chunk of your, your goal-scoring capability. Uh, but I do think as well, they can easily push for that second spot. As a Leeds fan, I hope they push for that second spot and get Man United back down where they belong. Um, but no, I do think they can. But yeah, echoing what you said as well, I think Vardy's big boots to fill, huge boots to fill. I think you do need to get a star signing in and someone of age. Um, and I think Schmeichel, I think he looked, he didn't look amazing yesterday for me. Um, there was a couple times where he, I think it was the goal. It was it was poor poor goalkeeping, and uh, I I mean a one on one is anyone's game. Um, but he didn't close the gap right for me and he, he didn't do a few things right. I just, I do think he's, he's looking a little bit off his game. And we know goalkeepers can go to a fine old age. Um, they, they tend to be often the oldest players on the pitch sometimes um, for the age they can go up to. And I do think Schmeichel can. But I think if Leicester really want to be challenging, I think Schmeichel's someone they've got to look to replace in the next couple of seasons. Um, Really, I think maybe this summer or next summer for me has got to be the window where they, they sort of say to Schmeichel that he's going to either play back up or get shipped off to another club. He's still good enough for Premier League, but I think he's not good enough for a title champion, uh, title title side. Um, and yeah, Vardy is as injury prone as he is. They need to really get someone strong in. Um, Brentford striker is not a bad option, but you, you want someone that's a little bit more prolific, maybe someone a little bit older. Um, you don't want to be pushing 30 again. That's something they don't want to be doing. I, I think any any older than 28 and they're sort of pushing it a little bit for me. Um, but there's plenty of strikers out there that could easily do the job. Um, but we, we all know Leicester in the transfer market are one of the best teams out there for the business they do. The teams they bring in and the players they get out. They, they rob Man United of 80 million for Harry Maguire. We all know that one. Um, and they brought in some players like Jamie Vardy for, I think it was about, was it one or three million pounds or something like that? Um, which bargain of the century, as we all know. So they're, they're very good at business and they know how to do it. And I think as long as they keep that up, they don't need to listen to anyone else but themselves. They know what they're doing in the market and they'll know how to run it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you're completely right with Cash Michael. I think he's, I think he's a loyal player. I think he'd stay around until he retires. 
play a backup role, cup, cup games, or even start a few games here and there. But I think they got to bring in a keeper this summer, in my opinion. Get in a young guy, 23, 24, maybe even younger. And then I think uh, you're right with Vardy. I think you need to bring someone in. I, I, I like Tony. I think he's a great striker, young English striker. I think he's 21 now at Brentford. He's throwing a lot of goals. He's really impressed. Uh, I think I think Vardy's going to stay for another two, maybe three years with how quick he is, unless unless injuries take his toll because injuries have really played on his his mind. But depending on injuries, he could leave earlier, but I can see two, two maybe three years. Bring in Tony, I hope, this summer for them because then if Vardy gets injured, you bring in Tony right into the starting 11, and it's a perfect fit, a young, fast English striker, which plays into the mold of their team, a lot of English players, a lot of young talent. And I think Leicester could go for this one because then Tony can stay behind Vardy, learn learn to trade, learn the Premier League. He doesn't get thrown in straight away. Or you're learning from a great manager like Brendan Rodgers, who's great at getting strikers goal scoring opportunities, and he's great with young talent. I've seen over years Raheem Sterling as one in his Liverpool days, as you see now. Pep Guardiola has taken him under his wing, but that was a great one under Sterling. And I think yeah, this Leicester team is unbelievable side i think they're gonna go go quite a ways and i don't think they're gonna knock united because i think uh once paul pogba comes back for us in a week or two once he's back from his injury i think it'll bring another dynamic to the midfield because you're not just sitting back deep with fred mctominay and hoping to hit it long to shaw or rashford to run down the line or dan james because then you don't really have anyone from the midfield to get it to bruno but besides united we'll talk about them later but um talked about lester for a little bit i want to talk about something that David Moyes has come out with earlier this morning. He was asked how much he thinks Declan Rice should be. There's been a lot of talk about Declan Rice leaving to United. There was Chelsea, but now Chelsea, you're really pulling out of the race since Frank Lampard's left. Thomas Tuchel thinks that area's the pitch is fine now with Jorginho, Kovacic, Mason Mount. And David Moyes was asked how much he thinks Declan Rice is. And he said, I don't agree with the owners that Declan Rice is worth 100 million. Far, far more than 100 million. Far, far more. For me, I've watched the prices of some players who have gone to clubs recently and they could not lace Declan Rice's boots. Do you think Declan Rice is worth more than $100 million, like David Moyes says, or do you think he's being absolutely ridiculous here by the West Ham manager's point of view? I think, yeah, I think he's being ridiculous there. Uh, $100 million nowadays, you, you've got to be talking world, world, world-class players. Your Ronaldo's and Messi's are your, your players that you're looking for going more than that. Um I'd maybe argue somewhere between 60 and 80 million for him, the kind of player he is. Um, 100 million for him, he's, he's, never, he's, he's never particularly done anything as Declan Rice. He's just he's a very good at what he does. And not to slag him off, I think he's a great player. Um, and I think he fits in that West Ham team well. I don't think 100 million. Um, I just think that's way over the top. He, he, You'd have to be saying Declan Rice is one of the best players in the world to put him at 100 million. And no offence to him, but there's a lot of players that are a lot better at doing that job than he is. Um, I, I could easily see him going for 80 at a push. I could easily see that happily. Um, I think on a good day he's worth that. But I can't, 100 million. Even from the managers. And then, and then, and then for him to go and, uh, for Moyes to say he's worth even more than 100 million. I don't know what he thinks the market is nowadays. I think he's been playing too much FIFA or something like that. But he's 100 million is just ridiculous for a player. Um, no player's worth that. No player. Maybe your Ronaldo and your Messi's worth that. Um, but no player should be playing more. And this is where the market's gone up in today's football. But but you've shown... You, I'm reverting back to Leeds because it's, it's a team I know a fair bit about. You, we, we've shown you... We, we got uh, Rodrigo in Spain's striker, so an international player, starting player, 30 million. Th there's no reason. And he, he, Rodrigo's obviously he's proven himself in our team. He's proven himself in the team before. He's a, he's a great player. 30 million is a fair price for him, uh, for a 29-year-old player. No player should be going for stupid, stupid money anymore. Oh, not anymore. We all know it's going to get worse. But money becomes too much of an issue in signing players in football. Um, and this is where it can get out of hand. And I will use the Maguire situation as an out of hand situation. £80 million for a defender was ridiculous. That is what you would pay for a, a top class striker nowadays. You wouldn't pay that for it. I don't know why United paid that for a defender. And it shows why they're in a lot of debt as a club. Um, yeah, £80 million is Harry Maguire of all players as well. Virgil van Dijk. 
two seasons ago, maybe, yeah, fair enough, 80 million. There's a stupid amount still, but for Virgil van Dijk, you'd sort of expect that number coming out with the way Liverpool treat him. But Harry Maguire, you'd be, you'd be pushing it at 40 million, 50 million. Um, he's a good player, he's a good player. He's, he's England class, he's England quality, but he's not He's not that much. Um, but yeah, no, Declan Rice, no, no chance. Um, and if I ever see him go for 100 million, football has gone down a wrong path. I mean, I, I can't. It's crazy to think that people are valuing defensive midfielders now at a hundred million. I, I don't understand how a defensive midfielder is going for hundred million. Like Erling Holland, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, same with Mbappe. Sure, put them for a hundred million. They're still 22, 21. They're attacking. They're going to put in the goals. A defensive midfielder, I can't see him going for a hundred million. I can see 80, 60. And when I say million for the Canadian fans, viewers, it's a hundred million pounds in English money. So that's almost double Canadian dollars. I'm pretty sure that's if I'm doing my conversion it's right. About one point five, I think. So you're talking like one uh, hundred and fifty million dollars Canadian. Yeah. So when you say a hundred million, so one hundred and fifty million, and that's just the fee between clubs for the Canadian viewers. And then you got to work out the contract, how much he's getting paid, the 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 agent fees. It's it gets ridiculous nowadays in football. I think I think the cost price for players is getting out of hand. I mean, we're talking. When we're talking about Jaden Sancho last summer going for hundred million, and that was the start of coronavirus. Yeah, I mean we're like like everyone's saying the cuts cuts in coronavirus got to cut off. We're losing TV deals somewhere. Like even in league, and they the hardly clubs are surviving. They're having to sell their best players, which we saw with Marseille go to uh, Sanson from Marseille go to Aston Villa. They they got twelve million, I think it was for them. He's their best footballer. That shows how much the money is barely going around in this coronavirus time for. Football, but then you got teams like West Ham demanding a hundred million for for Declan Rice. It's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, David Moyes needs to give his head a shake. I'm not sure what he's smoking out there in London, but my God, I think uh, he needs to give a check. He's been on Football Manager too much. Like you said, I think I think it's going between 60, 80 million. I think that's a fine price. I mean, I'd love for him to go to United. I, I'd pay anywhere from 60 to 80 million. 80 million, my most I'd pay. I'd give him straight to him because I think he's a fantastic footballer. I think he's going places. I think he'll carry this England team soon. In that midfield, he's a great, he's a fantastic player. I, I always doubted him, but this season he's really, really proved it to me. At this West Ham team, personally, I think the reason Moyes is saying a hundred million pounds is because he thinks they're getting Champions League football. And I think, I think he wants to try and build a Champions League side, and I. I think he wants to build it around Declan Rice, Suchek, and Lingard, and I don't think he's going to be able to get Champions League football and keep Declan Rice around here. I think Declan Rice is going to lead to a Champions League winning side, but we're going to move on to from a Champions League possibility team to the Champions League winners from last year right after this. This past weekend, we saw the Dirk Klaska rivalry between Dortmund and Bayern Munich. It was a 4-2 win for Bayern Munich, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Dortmund were up 2-0, nine minutes in from two early Erling Haaland goals. One came just a couple minutes in from Erling Haaland, a beautiful shot from outside the box. Deflected in off Albers' foot, but it was still a beautiful shot. And then nine minutes in, Thorgan Hazard unselfishly cuts it back. Erling Haaland with a little easy tap-in. Makes it 2-0, nine minutes in. Later on, Lewandowski scores a penalty and a nice sh nice tap in just before half, two goals before halftime to tie it. And later on in the game, they score two more to win 4-2. Beautiful hat trick from Lewandowski. I mean, the, the guy's been unbelievable. He has 31 goals so far in the league. It's, he's going for uh, Gerd Moller's record right now, which is 40. And there's still quite a bit of the season left in the Bundesliga. I mean... Do you think uh, Bayern Munich's going to run away with the league? I mean, they're only two points up here on Red Bull Leipzig for first place. But, I mean, Bayern Munich have a history of winning the league and whatnot. Do you think they're going to run away with it? Yeah, I think the team Bayern have got them in it. 
Um, they're just they're almost unbeatable. Um, they've just shown from two two goals behind in nine minutes. You you look there and you think Dortmund are going to come out and they're going to have a, a goal scoring frenzy here, especially with Haaland up front. Um, missing Sancho and they're still getting two in nine minutes. It was incredible. Um, but then to come back from that and go four two up is just something else. Um, I do, I do think that I I won't say fully unbeatable because no team's unbeatable. But they are looking extremely good, and they they've not all got young players in there as well, which is I think something to look at. Lewandowski's a fair age now; he's not a young player anymore, and he's still challenging. You know, I think you said thirty-one goals. It is. Yeah, thirty-one. Um, I, he'll beat that record easily, absolutely easily. Um, and I think Leipzig are looking okay as well, but it's unless unless injuries really take a toll um, on on. Uh, I'm buying, but I, I still think the, the players they've got as backup are more than good enough to keep them alive. Um, they're good enough, more than good enough. Lewandowski's a machine. The rest of that team is incredible. Alfonso Davies. Um, oh, the other one's gone out of my head now. There was a couple other players that highlighted for me during that game that were just absolutely incredible. Um, but I don't think Dortmund looked poor either. I think Dortmund were good at, to start with. Um, and you never like to see it when Harlan gets subbed off. It's always a sign as uh, you're looking to just stop conceding or because you're not looking to score more goals if you're bringing that kid off. Uh, but you fought two, two in nine minutes with a kid. You, you look at that and you're like, Jesus, Harlan's going to go to town on him here. Um, you, you thought he was going to get the hat trick and then Lewandowski wins the penalty and then he's got another one. One of the other players got one and then Lewandowski came out of his hat trick and it's just it's, it's what you want to see from a kind of derby like that. Just absolutely incredible football from both teams. Uh, goals scored throughout. It's, it's, it's an ideal game as just anyone that follows football. is. It's the perfect game to watch your derbies like that. Um, and I think Bayern and uh, Dortmund are two brilliant teams. And I don't think Dortmund can be ruled out. I think in the next few seasons, as long as they can keep players, I think they can still be um, They can still be winning up there. Um, but Bayern are just somewhere else lately. As long as they keep players... As long as they don't take injuries, I think they'll still be going for the World Club Champions again next year. Um, I still think they're looking. Um, but probably probably them again. Um, potentially Manchester City might have a final year at that Champions League winning spot. Um, but I think it's they're just, they're just somewhere else. For a team over that side of Europe, it's not often you see a team that runs away with a league like they are. Well, not runs away with a league, but run, runs away with a game like they can. Just, just so good. Yeah, they're a different kind of class, this Bayern team. Hansi Flick. I saw those two first goals, and Hansi, they put the camera on Dortmund's manager. He was jumping up with joy, and Flick was sitting on the bench, calm as could be. I think I think he knew it was coming still. But that, that Dortmund, used, I was watching during work, and I saw the two goals, and I couldn't believe it. Like This game was supposed to be so much hype, and then you saw those two early goals, and you thought this was going to be over so fast. And you just can't count this Bayern team out. They just came back. So much firepower this team has. Like you mentioned, Alfonso Davies, the young Canadian. Beautiful assist he had there for Robert Dudendowski's last goal there. Beautiful run down the line. Cuts in in the middle of the field. A little dummy by Kingsley Coleman. Let's go through his legs. And Lewandowski, beautiful finish, beautiful finish from outside the box. But like you said, uh, Lewandowski's getting up there in age. And holy man, he just keeps scoring. He's had 31 goals in a year, like I said. And like a fine wine. <laughs> He's going to break club legend's uh, record there, Gerd Muller's 40 goals in the season. I think he's only nine goals behind, and he still has a lot of the season to go. He still has quite a bit of games. But, yeah, it's this Dortmund team are questionable here. you got you got them sitting in the sixth place right now, holding on your Europa League spot by their teeth, barely sticking in there. And uh, they got a new coach coming in this summer, Michael Rose from uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach across town rivals. And uh, hopefully he can change things. But I want to talk about the uh, the derby here because when you watch different uh, leagues around the world, you got the uh, El Clasico and stuff like that, the Dirk Kleisker. You saw six goals this game. It was 4-2, quite a bit of action, not much defending. But when you go to England and you watch teams like United City, you watch Chelsea, Tottenham, Chelsea, Arsenal, it's nil-nils, one-nil. One team defends, one team attacks. Some stuff is very boring. Why do you think that differs, or do you think there's a reason for this, or is it just different styles of football, or what? what what's your opinion on that? It's a great question, um, and, and you are right. The Manchester derbies tend to always be 
Oh, I, I don't want to say one-sided. Cause we'll, we'll touch on the Manchester derby in a bit, but I do, I do think that it wasn't a one-sided game. But it, the scoreline represented that. Um, but you, your Merseyside derbies, your uh, your old firm derby Rangers versus Celtic, which is coming up next week as well. Um, but yeah, your, your London derby, you never tend to see massive goal scoring. Uh, games anymore, apart from when Southampton tend to once a season fancy just getting beat 9 nil for the fun of it, just change the league up a bit. Um, but now, apart from when you get stuff like that, you just don't get it. Um, you see more in a Yorkshire derby, I think, more than anything, and that's just because of Leeds' style of football. But yeah, I, I do think it comes down to the style of football yeah. in, in England. You often find um, teams go 1 nil up and they'll just defend. In, in, in big games when it when it's a big game like the Manchester derby yesterday um, Manchester United went, went one nil up and just sat back behind the ball defended were quite heavily um, and you see that from a lot of teams it's just defense 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 when you go a goal up especially if you're the team that's not expected to go a goal up if you're the team that's expecting to score you you, you do you do go and score a few more um, but yeah but even when you concede one, a lot of teams, if they concede one or concede two, then that's it. They'll just sit back and they'll be like, right, let's. it's going to be hard to win this. Let's sit back, defend and just not concede anymore and keep the goal difference where it's at. And where you see that happen to, that happens to Bayern and 2 nil down, they could have easily sat behind the ball and just said, right, let's, let's not concede anymore. Or Borussia Dortmund could have literally just sat behind the ball and said, let's not concede anymore. But both teams still went at it the whole game. Um, and I do think it comes down to play styles and the, the different ways to play between the leagues. And sometimes European football is so much better for it. So much better. Because teams just play. They, they don't play to win points. They, well, no, they do play to win points. It's all part of football. They, they don't play to sit behind the ball and just take... Like like we, we said Fulham are doing at the minute. They're, taking, they're, they're keeping a clean sheet. They're getting a goal or they're keeping a clean sheet. Um, you don't often see that as much in European football. Teams will still come out and play. Um, and we've seen teams, we, you have seen teams in relegation battles in England that will come out and they, they will look like they, they should be pushing for a Champions League spot if they'd have played like that all season because they're trying to keep out of a relegation zone. But apart from your relegation zone teams, you don't often see it. Um, it's just part of the bus. Um, it's, it's just part of the bus all day long. But yeah, Europe, Europe's way better for it. I think the, the the play style you tend to get from Europe, we all know Spain, Spain has been ticker tacker type football. Um, and that's why you see it. You never hear of Spain going part the bus type football. Spain's ticker tacker, and that's where it is. Um, and same in Germany, you get a lot of it. And I think it helps because you've got the Spanish players there. Spanish players in, in Spain prefer to play that style of football. And German players prefer to play their way, where English players, we, we come out with a lot of good defenders. Um, that, that's what England supplies a lot of to the to the national team, and I think that's why it happens more. Cause it, but it's, it's a boring style of football, and ringing Leeds is bell a little bit. That's why we we concede so many goals because even when I think we were four 0 down, it was it three or four 0 down against Arsenal, and we brought it back to three two or whatever it was. Or I, I can't remember to. But we, we, the kind of teams that don't back down from a result, and you, you want to see more of it. But today's football just yeah, it's just sit back relax, let them come at you or just control possession at the back of the field and don't do much with it. Yeah, I think like you say, it's a league thing. I think uh, I hate to talk about Jose Mourinho's interview for United, but I think you I think it's more of a heritage thing, as he would say. I think uh, how, the, how the leagues and the nations have grown up on it. But I think if you look at UK, they play such a relaxed kind of uh, sit back, let's defend kind of style like you were saying. You look at the rest of Europe, they attack. They Like Spain's known for the tiki taka. Germany, they're just, they just play some nice football. I remember watching Bayern Munich, I think it was Bochum the other week, and it was 4-3 or it was, it was just an attacking game and Bochum was bottom of the table and they're just going for it. It was a snowy game that they just, I don't know, it's just, it's a different style of play. Like you say, like I'm a lover of the Premier League. It's great teams, more competition at the top of the table. But it's just the derbies. Every team they score, they sit back. I, like even myself as a United fan, we scored that one with Bruno. We pressed a little bit for about 15 minutes. We just sat back. Like it, it's it's boring to watch. Like you go watch Dortmund Barn, like we're talking about here, and they just keep attacking and attacking and attacking, and they don't stop. This is why I like watching uh, 
uh, nation team better. Like I watch South American football so much better. They just attack with so much style. They play with so much skill. They, they're, I don't think I've ever seen a South American team like sit back with more than six men. They're, they're just always going back and forth, back and forth. It's like a game of pinball. They don't stop. It's so much fun to watch. Like, yes, the Premier League's fun. It's competitive, but they're no. They, it's such a boring style at times. That's why, like, if I recommend someone who's a hockey fan or a football fan, I'd say go watch Leeds United or go watch a team in a different league because you're going to see some attacking, entertaining football. You're not going to see some boring park the bus Tottenham United games and big games. It's just boring and no one wants to see it at times. Even myself as a lover of football, I just hate the style at times. And yes, it can be annoying, but we got to live with it as football fans. I mean, we've been talking about the Manchester Derby and um, we'll, we'll head right to it just after this right here. At Super 8 Winnipeg West, we have your comfort in mind with free Wi-Fi and free daily Superstart breakfast. We also have guest laundry facilities, a state-of-the-art fitness center, and a jetted hot tub. Sleep well in a spacious guest room equipped with plush new bedding, a 50-inch flat screen HD TV, microwave, mini refrigerator, and Keurig coffee maker. Or book a suite with a kitchen, ideal for extended stays. Super 8 Winnipeg West, located just inside the perimeter on Portage Avenue. Well, the big game of the weekend, the Manchester Derby that everyone was waiting for, the blue side of Manchester, who's in first place, and the red side, who's in second place. And as everyone I'm sure can see, I'm a, I'm a United fan, and uh, I was quite ex happy about this game. I mean, I was at work all day and during the game, and I was going to leave my notifications muted, and I couldn't resist checking the game. Once I looked at my phone and saw 2-0, I was, I was struck, and I looked at my text, and Daniel said in, this, in like the 15th minute, this is all City's game, and I couldn't believe it, but... The fact that we came out and won this game 2 nothing is unbelievable. Yes, we scored a penalty two minutes in, but we went for it right from minute one and we attacked them, which was impressive. I didn't think we were going to send a long ball and right, right go from their box. It was it was a good good idea by Oli to try to get an early attack in. And he got the penalty, which was well-deserved. It was an obvious penalty, in my opinion. I'm not sure what you think of it. But what do you think of uh, United-style play and um, the penalty call? Do you think it was worth the penalty or was it not a penalty, which we've seen most yeah. United came out so quick and so fast. I don't think City were expecting it, but we know this is United. They did it against Leeds as an example. They, they, the games, they come out quick and fast. They come out hard. Um, and, and they don't do it for 90 minutes, but the times they do do it, it's hard to defend against. Uh, we saw Rashford with a hell of a bit of pace on, and they got the ball in the box, and yeah, yeah. the player got tackled. 50-50 uh, for me. I, I'd have given penalty. I would have given penalty looking at hey Zeus, why is he there in my eyes? You got three defenders blocking the attacker. There was no need for Jesus to be there or even come in like he did. Um, fair enough, I'd add a little bit more, a uh, little bit more of a wall against the, the attacker, but there's no need for him to be there. Sticks his leg in penalty all day long. Um, don't get me wrong, you do see the player go down a little bit. The players go down easy nowadays. Yeah, commentators in the game said it could have been 50 50, but yeah, even I'd have given a penalty, and I hate United as we all know. So it's it's fair play there. Um, but I do think I, I think United played City well. Uh, they defended really well. Um, I thought Luke Shaw's run was incredible. Um, you, I, 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 you saw the build up, and I, I remember watching it with my dad, and uh, we were watching Luke Shaw, and he's running onto the ball, and you just see the first from the keeper throwing it out. Henderson threw it over to him, and you just see the touch he makes, and you're like, he's making some of this. You see him put a little bit of pace on, run across. You saw the little ball back out, and then the ball came back in. You saw him in space, and you're like, he's having a go. And <laughs> all credit to him for Luke Short make a shot like that. Really good yeah. shot, really good goal. Um, Bruno penalty uh, for the first goal. You, you've never doubt when it's Bruno. Um, I was really gutted for Edison. He managed to get a hand to it, just not enough behind. To, to put a hand on a Bruno penalty is enough, I think. <laughs> enough credit to him. Um, but yeah, no. But I don't think Man City looked bad, like you said, Lane. I texted you halfway through the yeah. game and I it still looked City's game. Me and my dad were downstairs watching it and we were like, it, it still looks City ruling this. It looks, you've no doubt City is still going to come at them like an absolute house on fire. But I just didn't think City looked good. Um, De Bruyne looked really poor yesterday for me, a lot of the balls. Um, and I think in general, the final third for City didn't look good. 
Um, every time they got into the final third, they couldn't string a pass together. It just didn't look great. Um, yeah, I think Aguero for me over Jesus should have happened. Um, I'd have brought him on, but maybe not the first half. Aguero is only coming back off injury. But I think second half, you're one nil down, Aguero on. Um, and I mean, I think the issue for Pep was City still looked good. And that was the issue. City was still coming at United. It was only a goal because of a penalty. United really didn't create much off of it. Um, so City was still coming at it. I think that's what sort of put Pep off making the, the substitutions. But for me, you're 1-0 down. Aguero's got a great record at scoring against United. Bring him on. Bring him on. Bring Foden on. Get that bit of creativity. Um, but I don't I don't think a few of the Man City players look great. I thought the defence looked solid. Um but then they just let you in a few times. The penalty was Jesus' fault, so we can't blame the defence there. And then I think the, the Luke Shaw goal was poor defending. All three of them were in front of it, and he managed to get through. Um, but the rest of the game, I thought the defending from them was good. Um, the CDM, uh, his name's just gone out of my head. Um, but Rodri. Uh, say again? Rodri? Yeah, Rodri. I thought Rodri looked poor all game. Um, I thought he looked absolutely shocking. You wouldn't even notice him, and then all of a sudden he'd come in and he'd either make a, a botch pass or he'd he'd try something that wouldn't work. Um, but yeah, De Bruyne, you'd expect everything off him from a game like that, and he just didn't didn't come out of it. Um, but like I said, you see, I, I still watched that game. City absolutely dominating it. You still expected City to get some off it, and don't get me wrong, um, one of the players absolutely killed the crossbar you thought it was going to smash like he hit it that hard there was a few times Foden on a couple free kicks when he eventually did come on you, you thought can they make some of this um, but yeah a couple of t- a couple of attempts and uh, Henderson had a good game for United and I think he saw it. I think that's a great game for him against Manchester City 28 games unbeaten for City and then Man, City, yeah, Man United beat him at home it, to be fair if you put money on anyone to do it it would be Man United at the Etihad um, but yeah, I do think Henderson was a great choice for him to come on. He's proved his worth in that game. Really has. But I thought, yeah, United just counted well. We all know how United play. They come out fast and get an early goal, counter well, and you know they're going to run away with it. Credit to him. It was it was what you want to see from a derby, really. Both teams, uh, Man City at it all game, Man United scoring the goals. It wasn't a bad derby. As I know we've talked about it and comparing it to your, your German and your, your European derbies and it there's nothing like it, but for as far as English derbies go, it wasn't a bad one. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I hate how managers to get talked about tactics, but all we always get slated for his tactics. And I think this game he set up beautifully. First 15 minutes, we got that early goal, which was fantastic. We needed that, and then 15 minutes, we just we kept a high line. It wasn't too far back. It was just good high line. United's forwards pressed. Daniel James. I think everyone gets he slates him too much, but he did an amazing job pressing. I think the front. Front line of uh, Man City. He didn't stop running. That's one thing I give him. He always keeps going. He keeps running head up. He's g- great for that. He doesn't stop press pressing that back line of City, which I loved. And you had United giving that front line for about the first 15 minutes, and then the last 30 minutes of the half, they just dropped back. They soaked up the pressure. Nothing really came up of City's chances besides that crossbar you said. And then second half, United came back out, pressed for the first 15 minutes again. I think City were probably shocked that we came out and pressed them again since we sat back for 30 minutes. First 15 minutes, second half, we went again, pressed them. We scored again the 49th, like you said, that beautiful goal from Luke Shaw. And then last 30 minutes, second half, we just sat back, soaked up pressure. And like you said, there was that really good chance from, I can't remember who it was that hit the crossbar, but it was a beautiful hit. They just slammed the crossbar, like you said. But besides that, nothing really scared me all game from City here. And you don't really think of that from a City team. Like you look at the stats, you have City having 23 shots, was it? And then United, I don't think it was, Seven, eight, nine. It was. It wasn't yeah, too. The, hard. The, the difference was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, United was, just looked so much better on the ball when they were in front of goal. Yeah. Um, City looked dangerous. Raheem Sterling looked dangerous all night. He had a couple of good headers, but just either not enough power behind it or not in the right place. He, he could have stuck a foot out a couple of times and he didn't. But I think Sterling looked good, but he just couldn't finish. Um, United played well. United. They knew how to play City. They came out and did it. Um, I don't know how Martial ended up with man of the match because I didn't think he did much all game in all personal honesty. Um, I don't think he played bad, but I wouldn't have said he was the man of the match performance. If if anything, I'd have probably given it to one of the City players that played the heart out a little bit better because United just didn't do much with the ball. 
Um, but if, if if you're going to pick any player, I'd have probably put Luke Shaw from the match, if anyone. Um, the goal was incredible and he defended well all game. But yeah, it's Martial with the man of the match. What was that all about? <laughs> but now, yeah, like you were saying, you, you just played well. The shots on target were incredible. For sitting, for them to not convert, at least one of them was fairly poor for them. Uh, but a good record for Henderson as well. Yeah, I think Ollie set up fantastically. He gets slated too much for his tactics. Yes, some games he's been poor. Crystal Palace, Newcastle, etc. But and Sheffield, lower teams, he's been his attacking ability because you got Fred and McTominay in the midfield who can't can't break a pass or can't make a pass to save their lives. But and then you get don't get Bruno to create anything. But especially Bruno here, you talk about Bruno in the Big Six. He's been talked about in the media constantly. He can't do anything in the big six games. He's been terrible big six games. His passing was great in the final third, I thought. I think he had a great penalty. Obviously, him and penalty spot, he's not going to miss. But Kevin De Bruyne was absolutely invisible, like you said. I couldn't believe how bad he was. And, yeah, like City, United, I'm always worried going into this game, and especially with the run they've been on. City known for creating chances, having shots on goal and whatnot. I wasn't scared once besides maybe that back post where Gabriel Jesus led into the post, but that would have been offside anyways. So it didn't really matter once I saw it second time. But yeah, they didn't really scare me. But Dean Henderson and Ned, I thought it was fantastic for him. For I mean, it's great that always letting De Gea go back to Spain to have be a father and to see his newborn newborn child. But Dean Henderson really stepped up this game. I thought if you do it with De Gea, you're never getting that throw out. De Gea is probably kicking it long. And I think Dean Henderson is much smarter and intelligent with his distribution. It was a beautiful throw to Luke Shaw, and he made a fantastic touch, like you said, and took the run unbelievably, and nice pass from Rashford. And to have that kind of a finish from a left back, I think that sums up Luke Shaw's season. He's been, in my opinion, he's been by far the best left back in the world, or left back in the league, and maybe even the world. There hasn't been – Davies hasn't had a fantastic season. He's been out with an injury most, most of the year. But in my opinion, he's up there for best left backs in the world, at least top three. I'm not sure. What do you think? Do you think he's best left back in the, one of the best left backs in the world, or best left back in the Premier League right now? I wouldn't say one of the best in the world. I mean, but I would say for the Premier League this season, he, he has been incredible. In fairness to him, and soak this up while you can, Len, because it's not often I'll praise Man United players. But um, no, he has been quality lately. Uh, fair credit to him. And he, he showed it. He's shown it against every team he's played so far. His defence has been spot on, um, and he's go forward. For a left back to come forward and do what he's done is is, is outstanding, um, and I would say he's up there for one of the players players of the season in his in his role. I don't, I can't think of any other players that have sort of been there instead. I mean, Man City haven't been bad in that position. Uh, I mean, uh, Regulon for Tottenham hasn't been bad, but he's he's not a name you sort of hear coming out of. Oh, he's had a really good performance. Oh, he's got a great goal. He's just been there. Um, and obviously, as we know, Tottenham are just sort of there lately at the times. Um, but yeah, I think Luke Shaw is definitely up there. Yeah, for sure. I completely agree as a United fan. I mean, I won't hear you talk about United this good for, we'll give it a couple episodes, hopefully, or maybe next week after Milan. But I'll give it a rest for now. And we'll move on to Scotland, where we saw Rangers finally win the Scottish Cup. It's been 10 long, long years for Rangers fans, as myself. I've been waiting for this one to come. I even texted you quite a bit and bugging you about Celtic and whatnot. But uh, it's been 10 years and Rangers have finally won their 50th Scottish Cup, the most out of any European club in the world. And it's, it? Oh, yeah, 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 correct. Yeah, it's unbelievable number, so high. Uh, did you ever think that uh, Steven Gerrard would walk into this and take us all the way to a Scottish Cup? I won't lie. I think Gerrard is a first managerial position. I mean, we're talking Scottish League, and we all know, realistically, you've you've Celtic and Rangers there. They're the only two teams, not to offend any Scottish people that might be watching or any Scottish fans, they're the only two teams that matter in Scotland, the Celtic and Rangers, and we all know it. Um, no, I, I, I had no doubt Rangers were going to bounce back. You knew it was only a matter of time. The, the history of the club's got, they're not going to lay down. Um, but I think Gerard, for his first managerial position to be winning the league, um, and doing what he's done with the club, they've been unbeaten all season. Um, as far as I'm right there, aren't they? Yeah, uh, unbeaten all season. He, he's been outstanding. He's been absolutely outstanding. Hey, I had a, had a Zoom call a few weeks back with him, uh, with one of my other jobs, and listening to him and what he's done with the club is it's incredible. And the passion he's got for the club is good. And he's, he's brought joy back to the fans. And I think the way he's been able to do it and 
God knows if he's trying to time it correctly, but making it so Celtic have got to give him the uh, the walkout next week is just oh. that. That's the cherry on top for any Rangers fan. I think the only downside is no Rangers fans in that's in those stands, absolutely screaming at the Celtic fans. There, it'll be it'd have been absolute scenes. Uh, I've got a lot of friends who are Rangers fans at the minute, and there's it's been flares and absolute crowd gatherings breaking the lockdown rules, and you can't blame them. Uh, long, long time they've been away from that title, and credit to them what they've done, the players, the passion they played with, and the way they played all season's been outstanding. Um, it's, it's a club with a lot of history and a lot of passion. I've got a lot of time for Rangers, and and the, there's a club and the fan base. Yeah, for sure, I completely agree with you. I never, nobody thought Stephen Gerrard would probably hit the ground running like this. His second season here, he's been unbelievable. I think the only loss he's had is in the Scottish Cup, which no one really minds yes he lost in the scottish cup big deal he's been un, un, unbeaten in the league unbeaten in the europa league he's taken the rangers the farthest they've ever gone he's gotten a decent draw in the europa league now going to round of 16 very favorable in his favor here they could even go on to this go quarterfinals and who knows who they could draw from there maybe we could move on and who knows europa league could be his next destination here he's only got the europa league to go he doesn't really need to worry about the league unless he wants to be an invincible like arsenal was but i mean like you say uh it's it's i'm i'm a rangers fan i was bug texting you quite a bit after we won it as you know your phone was probably buzzing for me but uh as a manchester united fan myself to be uh so thankful to steven gerrard really hurts but uh it's it was uh good to see them finally come back and win a game and it's great or uh, win win again and uh we had a Canadian actually win it, Scott Arfield. I, I'm not sure how many Canadians have won it. I'm sure he's probably one of few. We don't see too many Canadians. Go abroad like that. I'm guessing he's only the only one. It's great to see Scotty Arfield win it. He's done so much for the Canadian national team. And he scored some crucial goals for Rangers. and He's getting up there in age, but he's, he's done a good shift for them. And I hope Rangers can push on for the Europa League now. But I want to talk about one quick topic here. Do you think – any of these Rangers players could possibly make the jump up to the Premier League, or you think that's too far for them? Because there's some pretty quality players in this Rangers side. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always hard to say, um, looking at the Scottish League. It's a very different league. And as an English player, whose teams in the English leagues, every conversation is, where do you think Rangers and Celtic could be if they were in the English leagues? A lot of the time, my personal opinion is Celtic could be promotion side of championship um, whether that's playoffs or ch challenging and I do think Rangers would be a, a bottom half um, relegation battle uh, Premier League team um, they are a very good team in, in their league and they're very good in Europa um, but I think put them into an actual league and I think the, the, the bottom half you know, probably put them just a little bit lower than Leeds personally and that's not me being biased to Leeds but that's just where I think they probably end up in the league standings um, it's hard to say, and I, I, but I talking to players, I think Morelos could yeah. maybe um, make a move over. Uh, Kamar Roof's already done well as, as an ex Leeds player, he did well for us in the championship under the first season with Marcelo. Um, you could see him maybe, he, I think he'd be an ideal signing for a club that's recently been promoted. Um, a club that's just say for next season. I think a club that's coming up from promotion. If they need a striker, I think Kamaru is a great player and a great idea for him. Um, but yeah, I think you could see Morelos moving in. Um, I, I I don't know. Apart from that, it's, it, like you say, it's, it's just hard to say with it being with it being a different league. It's a completely different game altogether going up there. Um, but I think the big one for me that I'd be moving over to the Premier League would be Gerard himself. Um, yeah. I think. I think the second Klopp's out that door, um, I think you've got Gerard moving in there. And I think Gerard, credit to him, he's done what Frank Lampard should have done. Um, Frank Lampard had a failed season at Derby and got the manager as Chelsea job. It's too soon. He hasn't proved himself. I think Gerard now has proved himself of what he can do as a manager. And I do think it's it's only a matter of time before I think he'll stay at Rangers until that Liverpool job comes open. The second that door opens at Liverpool, they'll be straight in there. And I think as long as if he can do well, he'll be there for many years, many many years, um, as long as he can prove himself in the Premier League as well. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he proved himself in the Championship first. If Gerard wanted to make a move to the Championship, 
Um, but he's, he'll definitely see the season out with Celtic, and I, I, I would I would think he'd do one more at least. Uh, with Rangers, sorry. Uh, I'd upset, no, I'd upset yeah. a few Rangers yeah. fans. Uh, he'll definitely do a few more seasons, at least one more season with Rangers. And then I either think he'll either come knocking on a championship door, um, or he'll wait for that. He'll wait for that Liverpool job to come open. And I, I'm pretty sure Liverpool will probably already have him in mind. Same as I bet Chelsea had Frank in line before, before the other one left. And there'll, there'll be another one with John Terry. He'll be there in a couple of years if he can prove himself being a little bit better at, at Villa. We all know it, it's it's how it's played now. Um, as you know yourself, Ole's an ex-Man United player. Um, you, you've got other ones. Uh, who's the other one in the league? Uh, Arteta's an Ar- ex-Arsenal player. It's going to be ex-player generation of coming in and managing. Mm-hmm. Gerard's the next one for me, and I think as he, he's uh, he can he can do well. Uh, to be fair, at the minute, looking how Liverpool are, how long is it until Klopp leaves if he keeps this up? Um, I think they'll see him out for the season and probably give him another chance at the start of next season. Personally, Klopp. But if you can't keep going next season, I think they might just say see you later. Get yourself off and Gerard welcoming him back down to to England. Yeah, for sure. I think we can talk about Rangers all day. I think we could see Morelos go to a top a decent mid table club like Southampton or something like that. He's a great goal scorer. It'd be interesting to see what he could do in the Premier League. And I think uh, James Tavernier is a right back. He's been unbelievable. Assists, goals, crazy His free kick style is unbelievable. I think he'd go to the club. And even though England has abundance of right backs. But I think uh, Jared's another one in those three. I think we'll move on to the CONCACAF right now. Jamaica's looking like they're going to try and take over the CONCACAF division in uh, in in uh, North America here. And you got USA and Mexico as the powerhouses, and it looks like Jamaica wants to change things here. And they're talking about bringing in 10 English players, and they're currently – the Jamaican Football Federation is in the works of signing – bringing in 10 English players and getting their passports, their visas, and getting them into the – the system for the next CONCACAF Gold Cup and the next World Cup and so on because they think they can make a push, which I think if they can get these English players in, it would be very interesting. I got them on a list right here. I'll just read them out. Max Ahrens, the right back for Norwich, who's been talked about going to Bayern Munich, Manchester United, so on. He's a fantastic talent. Andre Gray from Watford, a striker. Damari Gray, uh, ex-Leicester uh, winger, who now plays for Leverkusen in the Bundesliga. Uh, Isaac Hayden, a defensive midfielder for Newcastle. Mason Holgate, the center half for Everton. Liam Moore from Reading. Nathan Re- Redman, the winger from Southampton. Kamar Roof, who we talked about, the ex lead striker. And Ivan Tony from Brentford. These, these are some players that probably would never make the English squad. For Jamaica, it'd be a huge, huge boost. Fantastic. They'd be like an all star team in the CONCACAF division. Do you think this team would be able to be, beat USA and Mexico commandingly? And, Obviously, Canada don't, wouldn't stand a chance against that team, I could admit. Do you think uh, they'd beat USA and Mexico and go all the way to the World Cup? Yeah, I think they'd definitely beat USA. Um, I think on a good day, they'll beat Mexico easy. Uh, all that Jamaica have done there is they've looked for the English players with Jamaican roots, the ones that aren't good enough to make the England squad and gone, we'll have you, get, <laughs> get over here, come on, pick you up. and uh, You're not going to get English international football, but we'll give you some taste of it. Um, fair play to him. I know yeah. if I if I had if I had Jamaican roots and I wasn't going to get into the English squad, I'd be over there as well. Um, same with a lot of other the, the English players. It's been renowned in the English game that they've done it. Um, there was a couple English players with Irish roots that changed their the nationalities to Irish just so they could get game time in, in international teams. You can't blame him. You can't blame him one bit. Um, if you're good enough to make it in some international team, you want to be doing it. You want to get caps. Um, so go for it. Uh, but yeah, I do think, I think Jamaica could be, if, if they get a good run and if they get a good pick of the teams as well, it, it does come down. And we always say it, it's footballs on anyone's day, but England, the best proof of it in the last World Cup, we had an easy running into that semi-final and then it hit us like a brick wall. Um it really did, and I think if if they can get a, a nice easy running um, with a couple of easy teams in the qualifiers, I think they can make World Cup. And I think, given on their day, they might they might come up against a difficult team. England, as we know, on their day, are the worst team in the world because they're absolutely uh, on on their off day. Sorry, they're one of the worst teams in the world. <laughs> yeah. They're just not consistent. Um, they're just shocking. 
But yeah, yeah, I mean, Macedonia approved it. They're not the best team, but if it might be an awful. If you get a fairly easy run up, you, you can do it. Um, and as long as you, you just clutch up when it comes to the big games, if anyone's game is football. And it, it's different when you, you bring players together. It's not like we were saying earlier with a Premier League team against, this, say, a Spanish team. You've got the part of the bus style a lot and then the tick attacker. It's not like that when you're playing for your international team. The tactics come down purely to the manager, which makes them so much harder to play against. Um, if you get a manager that likes to change up tactics a lot, your players are all going to play different. Obviously, we we know like the Spanish national team will play tikka taka, um, but you you know with your other national teams, it's hard to, it's hard to judge. You got players that play in the Premier League, you got players that play in European leagues, Mexican leagues, Jamaican leagues. So it's it's going to be a hard one. But yeah, I do think I think. They can make it in the World Cup with with those players. That squad, if they can keep that, if they can get that squad, that is that is a, a world a, a World Cup qualifying squad easily. Yeah. Well, especially in the cap division, because you got basically five teams: Costa Rica, Canada, Mexico, USA, and Jamaica. No, and I think you're only going to see a couple of those teams go. And I think it's probably going to be Jamaica, USA, and Mexico. Sadly, I don't think Canada will do it if Jamaica gets this team. Because Jamaica is going to be unstoppable if they get that team. They'll be playing some unbelievable stuff. They'll have a fast attacking unit. And Canada is not known for having the greatest back line. I, I hate to say it. We got Davies and basically nobody. Like, it, it's, it's we're a really weak back line. We got our field. We got Jonathan David, Junior Hoylet, uh, Kyle Laren in Turkey. But besides that, our back line is awful. I think, this, like you said, this Jamaican team, they're basically picking off the English players that have roots. I, and would never make the World Cup. And I think any player wants to go to the World Cup and have the feeling, enjoy the time. And I think they're definitely those players are probably easily going to take that offer and join Jamaica and make the World Cup. I think they could make it past the group stage, like you say. On their day, any team can win. It's football. Yeah. But yeah, this calf division is very. It's not the strongest, but you do have some very strong sides that can make a push in the World Cup, but not too far, obviously, because we haven't seen a calf team win it. In, Cool. God knows how long. I don't, I don't even want to go back that far as a North American myself. But I think we'll wrap it up here this week for Off the Pitch. It's been a, it's been a great episode. I'd like to thank everyone for watching us this week and last week. And we'll see you next week for another great episode of Off the Pitch. Thank you, everyone.